Me Guyana Land of many waters with her Six races living together Globespan is a Guyanese dialogue moving towards the realization of one nation in one Guyana. It's a platform that offers an all-inclusive discussion, with the pros, the cons, the ones that is taken aside, and the ones that stand in the middle. Globespan believes agreeing and disagreeing are part of the nation's building. Globespan believes that every Guyan's voice is part of the nation's building. As we span the globe for voices from the diasporas and those living home, we stand on our commitment that we are all Guyanese working towards one nation in one Guyana. As the world turns on its axis bringing changes, we as Guyanese must adopt to those changes for a better Guyana for all. Globespan stands on its axis with its belief that one nation, one Guyana, one destiny must include voices from all corners of Guyana. So, welcome viewers and listeners to another edition of Globespan 24 7. Globespan is owned and operated by Mr. Nohar Singh. Joining us tonight for our weekly debate, it, as usual, is Devin Dassoon, he's the technical operator. Tonight, we are discussing a very, very interesting topic rigged elections and democracy. Before we get started with that topic, let us. Uh, introduce the panelists for tonight. We have two, four, in fact, very, very eminent and prominent personalities in Guyana's political affairs. Two, or one, is a former politician. One, a current politician. Um, two, are very outstanding academics. And in addition to being academics, they are also some of the most eminent writers in the mass media in Guyana, as well as in books and journals magazines. Two of three of them, as far as I know, have a very long history of uh, political activism in Guyana, going back to the 60s or 70s, at least. And um, one is relatively a newcomer, I would say much younger than, than the three of the others and myself. Um, so let me introduce uh, the panelists for tonight. Joining us tonight is current member of parliament, Senior Counsel, Mr. Roysdale Ford. <clears throat> Former parliamentarian, Mr. Bravindra Dev, who himself is also a lawyer and who is in the media very regularly in Guyana with his weekly column. We have uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Betaram Ramarak, uh, one of the finest uh, writers and uh, biographers of Guyana and of Guyanese. And we have Professor David Hines, both uh, David Hines and Ramarak are uh, professors in the United States. Ravindra Dev and Royce Ford are primarily based in Guyana, and, and, and uh, David Hines makes his own back and forth uh, between Guyana and, and New York. Gentlemen, thank you all very much for joining us for this very, very important topic and discussion, and with your long history of political activism, I'm sure you are going to give us some very, very enlightening discussions on rigged elections and democracy. I think first, before we begin, we should have some kind of uh, definition of what is a rigged election and what is democracy. Um, shall we say, we'll go with the uh, professor first, David Hines. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think democracy is, and I'll deal with that one, I don't know that there is a definition for rigged elections, but um, certainly there are definitions um, of uh, democracy. Um, the definition of democracy that I um, embrace is a definition that was made popular by our own Sir Arthur Lewis, um, who um, argued that uh, a democracy must mean that all those who are affected by a decision must be at the table to make that decision. 
And I have embraced that definition of democracy because I think it speaks to what we refer to as substantive democracy. There is what you call formal democracy, where you have institutions that work, um, you have regular elections, um, you have a parliament, you have a functioning government, and so forth. Uh, and, and so we refer to that as formal, um, formal democracy. Uh, but, but that by itself, according to um, uh, Otto Lewis, is not enough. We have to move towards the substantive aspect of democracy after the institutions and, and the elections. Um, what happens? What happens? Are the people in the country involved in the decision making um, in the country? And I think that's where um, Lewis then poses a question for um, uh, more for societies like, like, like ours, like Guyana, countries like Guyana, where um, uh, the country is not as homogeneous as, let's say, some other countries, culturally homogeneous, ethnically homogeneous. It's not, right? Um, uh, uh, it's more heterogeneous. And so, therefore, the issue of the participation of groups then become important. So one can define democracy uh, from an individual standpoint, I mean, the rights of the individual, for example. But one can also define democracy from the rights of groups within a society. And I think the nature of the society, I'm arguing, therefore, determines the definition for democracy. So the formal definition for democracy, the ones that Beta Ram and I teach every day, um, doesn't talk about democracy in Guyana and, and Trinidad and, 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 and Kenya and, and, and Zimbabwe and Fiji. It talks about democracy in the United States of America and European societies, all right? And so therefore, there is a limited definition of democracy. Um, but when you come to other societies, other new societies, post-plantation post societies, post-colonial societies, themselves creatures of colonialism, then you have to begin to talk about not a different, but a broader definition of democracy that speaks to the dynamics of those countries. Um, in terms of what is a real election, I believe that I don't think there's a definition for what is real election. There's real election and there's real election. I don't think there's a definition for it. Thank you. Let's, let's, let's hear the other professor, what, what, what he feels about whether there is a definition of real election and democracy. Betram Ramarak. Well, let, let me let me just pick up from where uh, David left off, uh, which is the idea that we are a different society. You know, we're not like the Europeans, uh, you know, who have settled their issues over over time. Uh, we are a relatively new country, um, and we certainly have issues that we're dealing with that's different from a lot of countries. Um, but it's pretty common among third world countries, which is the fact that you know, people have called Guyana a, a plural society because you, you're made up of, you know, ethnic communities. And uh, in the case of Guyana, you have two dominant groups, right? Um, Africans and Indians. Um, so we can go back to the 1950s and argue that, well, um, you know, our democracy was represented by the fact that you had uh, major political parties, the group interests were represented, and there was an election. But obviously that dynamic of being a plural society and having a history that has been shaped uh, by the Europeans, um, you know, we see uh, problems in the 1950s, right, uh, when there was a split in the national movement. So uh, we have a society today, um, you know, where people on both sides of the fence, when you have election, in a sort of a bipolar society like ours, um, generally one group will win, the other group is excluded. Uh, that's again in theory. Um, so the challenge for our democracy is to ensure a level of inclusivity, right? So that everybody have a voice and a say in government. But again, it's a challenge. And when we talk about, you know, um, rigged election, uh, that seems to be a concept that's always being revived every time we have an election. 
Um, and uh, so, you know, you can make an argument that we, we have a situation in Ghana where uh, we have, uh, in a sense, perfected, um, you know, certain means of, you know, controlling and manipulating elections uh, in the past, obviously, um, starting with 1968, if we're talking about national elections, um, you know, we've seen that trend where the control was very extreme and extensive to, to preserve one political party uh, in office, right? Let me the PNC. Um, that has changed since 1992, uh, you know, and again, uh, it, it, again, the, the notion of rigged election has always been uh, come into play. Um, the most uh, blatant of which we have seen, or accusations, I should say, uh, an attempt to rig the election was in uh, 2020. Um, and so we are still trying to deal uh, with this whole notion of being a plural society. We have uh, two dominant groups. Um, I will argue that the Amerindians are also um, a group that is going to have a fair share of decision to make because they are a growing community. Um, as well as the mixed community. So, so, but, but the one thing I would say to end this is we're not so much of a bipolar society as we were in the past because the population dynamics has changed, right? Um, so the dominant party, whichever it is, whichever party wins the election out of the two has to have some kind of crossover vote from the other side or other communities to be able to um, to have that legitimacy uh, to govern. But I will end by saying the challenge for us as a plural society is to promote that inclusivity to make sure that everybody is part and parcel of that process, that whole notion of, you know, uh, being governed and being part of the national good and, and, and so on. Yeah. So you, you are breaking up, Vishnu. I don't know. If... Hello? Yes. Um, can we make... Any better? Uh, this is better, yeah. Yes, go ahead. Right. City Council, rise the board. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, I believe that the professors have accurately and adequately established um, a proper working definition for the purposes of our conversation this evening in relation to democracy. Um, but I believe that um, I, I would like to um, descriptively more describe election rigging as a process where you interfere with the electoral process um, by a variety of means, um, ranging from vote manipulation, um, vote impersonation, and the, I believe the variety um, and the uh, manner in which um, cannot really be defined, it could only be described, but it's ultimately an interference with the legitimate electoral process. Um, I know I heard the professor say that we have had a long history um, of um, allegations back and forth. Some people feel that it has been concretized in terms of allegations of vote rigging and vote manipulation. But I believe that the last elections um, really and truly highlighted the extent to which um, there was, in fact, voter manipulation in the country. Um, I believe the records produced by the Elections Commission itself adequately um, described and recorded very worrying trends of voter manipulation. I believe that um, in the society as a whole, um, the politicians throw the blame is the PNC back and forth. But I believe that when you look at it, and the PNC will say that with some justification that it's the PPP who had done a number of things in terms of voter manipulation and voter fraud. But I believe that when we look to see what would have been the report which came out of the electoral body, um, it disclosed some very worrying trends. Um, I, I had an opportunity to just summarize them I could go into greater statistics, but I believe it's important to highlight that what, I, what was recorded in Region 1, the Electoral District Region 1, 35 percent of the total votes cast were affected by anomalies or voting impersonation. In, in Region 2, 
it was 75% of the total votes cast. In Region 3, it was 68%. In Region 4, it was 55%. In Region 5, it was 51%. Region 6, 77%. Region 7, 71%. Region 8, 54%. Region 9, 80% of the votes cast in each electoral district. And in Region 10, 17% of the votes cast. So you certainly see that there is a institutional problem um, which would allow the facilitation of this sort of process. This is the Elections Commission um, after the 2020 um, general and regional elections. The reason why I would like to use that, um, that election as, as the basis for our discussions is because this is the first time for good or for bad, and I have my personal views, which I publicly stated um, in relation to the 2020 elections and the recount process. But this would have been the first time that the nation would have had an opportunity to look back at what is in a ballot box after the conclusion of an election. Um, for years, we would have had um, the conversation and the allegations and the back and forth. But when at this elections, we had an opportunity to open the ballot boxes across the country, I believe what we found should have been the source of much consternation. I don't see the society necessarily um, speaking about what was found in the ballot boxes in the context of um, democracy and real representation and real participation, because we must agree that the natural consequence of vote rigging or manipulation is to distort the true representation of the votes cast and necessarily the distribution of power which emerges from an electoral process. So you will have instances building on what the professor said that we are more um, probably a, a less plural society or a less um, divided society. So what is really going to happen going forward is that the battle for government will necessarily require a greater proportionate shares from the other side. And when that is not capable, you can readily rely on voter manipulation to carry over the point which would allow you to be in governance, to move, for example, from a minority government to a functioning government. The consequences of a minority government and a government that has a full majority in parliament, we all know, we saw it over the last 10, 15 years in government, in, in the operation of government in Guyana. But I believe that those are important issues and I believe that the society has not focused on them in terms of how we deal and seek to reform um, at the institutional level um, the electoral process. Uh, Mr. Ravindra Dev? Well, let me start with the um, electoral rigging uh, question. And I'd also like to offer my two cents on the on democracy uh, in our society. Um, Specifically, uh, on electoral rigging, um, again, as Mr. Ford uh, said, um, you know, it's just you got to describe it, and in a sense, uh, let us deal with concrete specifics so you can hone in on it. So, for example, uh, in Guyana, uh, the electoral rigging started in 1968, and um, because the 64 elections. Uh, while it was manipulated by the British to move from um, first past the post uh, electoral system to proportional representation, that was a manipulation because it had been used uh, from the beginning and it's been used in England uh, from their beginning hundreds of years ago. But they manipulated uh, the system to, to give uh, an advantage to uh, the PNC and the UF, and, we, and these are matters of declassified files that we can point to. So the rigging started in 1968 uh, after they had been ensconced, but uh, by 1968, it was very clear that Mr. Burnham decided that he was not going to go the, ro the route of having a coalition uh, partner to bridge the divide in, in Guyana. He insisted that he was going to go alone and he used uh, various mechanisms. One attempt he did was, uh, it, while we might not call it rigging, but it shows his thought process. And uh, Desmond Hoyt 
um, Memorial Lecture of 2008, Prime Minister Mitchell of St. Vincent revealed that as back in 1967, Mr. Burnham had spoken to Prime Minister Compton of St. Vincent and had asked him, and Compton visited Guyana in You mean Cato? Huh? You mean Cato? Cato, sorry, sorry. Uh, who, who did I say? Milton, you said Compton. Sorry, Compton sorry. Is Cato. Uh, Cato. Cato. Milton, Milton, Cato. Thank David. And uh, he had proposed um, that uh, that St. That, uh, St. Vincent um, has an associate association with Guyana rather than Britain. And uh, when that was revealed, Prime Minister Mitchell, that was what made him leave, uh, protest in the Labour Party and leave. So it was a way of bringing together a group or an island that he felt those people would vote with him. But he then, when that fell apart, he continued and he was financed by the CIA and, and they went ahead with his plans, which was to uh, deal primarily with the overseas votes in England, in, America, uh, in the States and elsewhere to pad those votes rather heavily. And so that was the beginning of, um, the, of electoral rigging as a concrete system. But I think we need to look at the why, because uh, for a democracy at our, or the democracy that the British had created to allow Mr. Barnum to come in, it, he was given a, me a methodology. Coalesce uh, in, in, in uh, PR, you try to agglomerate as many votes as you can and coalition is one of them. And uh, he went that route, but again, because he felt he needed to, to have power um, for the PNC and by the PNC alone, he went the electoral route, he went the rigging route, and that has not changed. And that is what happened in 73. It happened in the referendum of 78. It happened in 1980 when the WPA, of which uh, David is part of, protested by refusing to go along with all the arrangements that have been made. They didn't go along uh, and, and participate in that uh, election of 1980. In 1985, where they did participate, they documented tremendous number of violations uh, during that election. 92 we know, 97 we know, uh, the, the, the foot was on the other, the, the shoe was in the other foot, where the PNC claimed that uh, the PPP had rigged those elections. And uh, there's a bit of ambiguity which needs to be cleared up. So that matter created tremendous uh, problems for us because the PNC protested in the streets of Georgetown. Uh, houses were burnt, people were beaten. Uh, all manner of um, mayhem was created because of um, this claim of the PPP rigging. But we did have a, a commission of inquiry, the, the Cross Commission uh, came in, eminent Juris Cross from uh, Trinidad, and he examined uh, you know, the, the details of that election. And he concluded that there was not rigging. All elections have certain flaws, certain uh, elements that will go wrong. Uh, the point is, and the, and the matter also went to the court where Justice um, uh, Singh, right? Claudia Singh looked at the matter and said those aberrations were not enough to have changed the election result, right? So you had uh, uh, Claudette Singh saying that the, 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 the peccadilloes that occurred would not have changed the result, and that is, is, is a crucial matter, and Cross insisting on the same thing. But because the election was vitiated uh, for a different reason, and this is again when we play around, the PNC had agreed that um, ID cards uh, must be required for you to vote. And the PNC, even though they had agreed before the elections, when they lost, in addition to, to saying the election was rigged, said that was unconstitutional, that the Constitution uh, does not demand uh, this uh, national ID to, to be able to vote. And Justice Singh officiated the election results on that technicality which the PNC reneged on its own um, uh, word, 
uh, not not an unusual situation. So um, that is my take on the rigging. Those are the concrete examples. So Mr. Ford talked about a, a, a large percentage of these votes in the 2020 election that had quote unquote problems. But we know essentially what the Guyana Elections Commission ruled, which is that through the manipulation of Mr. Mingo and Mr. Lowenfield and others in GCOM, they were taking away the right to vote for over 100,000 Guyanese citizens. And yes, there were some uh, um, votes that some, some uh, dead people voted, some overseas people voted. But here again, it was not enough to materially affect the results. And you, we did have a result by GCOM. And that result says that there was a, a rigging attempt based on Mr. Mingo, and this is one form of rigging, not using that which was specified to call out from the SOPs, right? Uh, and he used a, a sheet, uh, a spreadsheet, which had different numbers. And we eventually know that, uh, you know, that is the, the, the new one way of um, uh, rigging, which was caught before uh, it could do the damage. So, but to come back to where I think we need to focus on, rigging we know has happened. And uh, we, we hear now that uh, Mr. Green uh, recently has uh, openly said that um, maybe that is the way to go about in the future uh, because African Guyanese have a, a prior right to rule this country, therefore uh, to use whatever means necessary, including rigging. So I want to say that this goes against the grain of what we are all trying to do in this country. Yes, we are a plural society and we must be able to work out a mechanism for people to feel represented and be involved in decision making. And when uh, Sir Arthur Lewis talked about uh, his proposal in his little booklet, Politics of West Africa, that was in 1965, uh, right? He wrote that book in 65. And he was talking about West African societies that were divided by tribe and you know, not much different from that. So it does have some applicability. But uh, what I've always pointed out for at least a hundred times, whenever Sir Arthur's name comes up, that Sir Arthur didn't just make that suggestion. He offered a concrete proposal. And the proposal he made were two, one, coalition, and two, federalism. Federalism, of course, is somehow um, a, 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 a bogeyman to uh, all other groups in Guyana. As a group, Rohr has suggested it, that federalism is one methodology to diffuse uh, uh, power at the center. Uh, but the second one is um, coalition. And th that we see in Guyana, that has consistently been tried by the PNC and jettisoned. They got into power in 64 through a coalition, dumped the UF. Got into power in 2015 with the AFC, then apart from walking all over the, the, the AFC, then uh, in, in basically dumped them by firing P AFC supporters. So the point is that we do not, it's not that we don't have a methodology for having democracy in Guyana. It is just that the PNC refused to look at uh, certain methodologies. And I will speak a little further about uh, the situation in which we have find ourselves that we are a nation in, of minorities, which pre present us with another uh, method of achieving stable government. Thank you. Professor, um, uh, we, have, we have very good, very good of of bringing, uh, 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 an uh, well, 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 not an adequate uh, definition that uh, can be defined. Um, you yourself have played a very, very important and prominent role against the 70s, 80s, and the free and fair election of 1992. What, what, what do you make of this whole argument of rigging? 
Yeah, I, and thanks very much. And thanks for reminding that I opposed Reagan from as far back as the 1970s, and I'm still opposing Reagan today. And I'll, and I'll explain why. Um, I want to take a different point of departure from Ravi. Ravi's point of departure is the PNC and Borno. So what that leads to is that Reagan is essentialized to the PNC and Borno. I want to move away from that mode of analysis. And to say what we have is a plural society in which two groups, neither of which wants to be governed by the other, both of which have their own political party. And so what we had at the beginning of our post-independence experience is that one group had a numerical majority and one group a numerical minority, if you will. And so therefore, with that framework operating within the context of majoritarian politics, that is you need a majority in order to govern, um, both groups, the group that was in the minority without a majority, um, gravitate to, towards rigging in order to manufacture a majority. And that continued over time. By the time we got to the last 20, 25 years, the group that was a majority lost that majority status numerically. And so it found itself in the same position of the other group. And that it, it has to manufacture a majority to win. Now, we have a situation in which neither party is able to coerce, to buy, or to, um, to, to, um, to, to coach people or, 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 or um, talk them into crossing over. It has not been allowed to happen because of the sharp division that we have had. Um, and I don't think either group will allow the other group to poach on its, um, its, its supporters. That has been borne out by our history. So therefore, the groups and their organizations are lured towards rigging as a means of getting a majority. And so while the, the PNC started it, later on when the PPP's constituency became a minority constituency, they fell in line with the same kind of uh, approach. Now, as Roysdale um, Ford pointed out, there are different forms of rigging. The PPP, the PNC back in the old days, engage in multiple voting and, and, and counting, um, not counting the votes at the place of polling, etc. That's well documented. What the 2020 election really revealed in a, in, 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 an, in, in a sense, in an unconstitutional way, because the recount itself was unconstitutional to my mind. But that unconstitutional action really brought out and really brought to the forum other forms of rigging that the, PP, the PNC may not have used, but that is being used now, and that the PPP is guilty of these new forms of rigging. The voters list is a clear example, all right? As Roysdale said, the first time you open the box, that has never happened. And in opening the boxes, we found other areas of electoral manipulation and you know manipulations taken together is what we refer to as rigging and so therefore um uh, 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 rigging is part of the process of our the political process of our plural society that is we have a sociological situation with two groups of equal magnitude they might be they might differ numerically, but they can inflict blows on the other um, because of how they're located in the political economy. You have two groups of um, equal strength and they're fighting for government under a majoritarian system. They have to have a majority. 
And so therefore, they are lured towards manipulation in order to manufacture that, major that majority. I know that um, uh, uh, um, Ravi has said that we are now a nation of minorities. And so therefore, that, will, that should encourage us to seek crossover votes. But you, you, you're asking, you're asking a society to do the impossible. Our society is anti-crossover votes. We have shown that over and over again. The UF was supported by Amerindians and Portuguese in the main. When the AFC came on the scene, it was first supported by Africans and then supported by Indians. So we don't have the... Um, the, 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 the sociological framework, the sociological instincts for that crossover vote. Indians cross from the PPP to the AFC, some of them, in 2015, 2011, and maybe 2020, I don't know. But they didn't cross over to the PNC. They crossed to the AFC, which they saw as an Indian party. In 2006, the Africans who left the PNC reduced the PNC to its lowest electoral returns. They crossed into an AFC led by Rafael Trotman. They didn't cross over to the PPP, right? So this thing about crossover vote, I think it is a wishful thinking in Guyana. And so therefore, in the absence of that crossover vote, um, and in the presence of a majoritarian system, the parties are logically going to move towards rigging. In the end, I think, unless we have constitutional change, which moves away from a majoritarian democracy to a more consensus democracy, if we don't do that, then rigging will become and remain, sorry, will, Reagan will remain a staple. The different groups, different parties will do Reagan the way they see it, because you don't want the rig to be caught. But Reagan is inevitable in a majoritarian situation where neither group wants to be governed um, by the other. So unless we have constitutional change, um, uh, 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 to bring about a more consensus democracy, I'm afraid Reagan will remain a staple. Let, let, let's, let's get a view of, of Professor Dr. Betaram Ramarak. And, and, and before I, I do, let me also point out that Betaram and myself were involved in a very, very long struggle from the 70s through 1992. Uh, electoral race for free and um, and, and while while I also have him here, let me also congratulate him on being shortlisted for his uh, biography, uh, his most recent publication on uh, Alice uh, Bagundai Singh. Um, from Rangwork, before we talked about your response to David Hines and others, can you talk a little about your book, if you don't mind? Well, you what? know, being being a modest fellow myself, I, I don't like to promote myself or anything I've written on a show, but I'll be a little shameless tonight. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the book on Alice Singh, um, who was actually born in Suriname, uh, she was very much involved in, uh, you know, uplifting Indian culture uh, in the early 1900s. Um, her husband, who I've also written a book on, Jang Bahadur Singh, was a ship surgeon. He worked on the ship that brought uh, Girmitias, uh, Indian indentured laborers, back and forth from India and to other places. Um, so that book uh, on Alice Singh um, has been shortlisted. Um, and the winners will be announced on Friday, um, this Friday coming. Uh, but I do also want to shamelessly also announce that I, I just got a copy of this one. Um, this, it, the title is One One Dutty Build a Village uh, in Guyana, which is really the history of um, a village, which you can, I guess you can call it a tongue in Guyana, Prashad Nagar. Uh, so it's about the story about the person who built that village and the village itself. So um, hopefully it will be launched in Guyana. But um, 
if you can put that aside, um, I want to get back to David because uh, sometimes David has a way of saying things uh, that gets me a little agitated and I'm listening to him here. And I do think he is, he is fixated in a past that doesn't exist um, at this stage in the game. Um, but let me just say this, um, you know, in the 1980s and 90s, the, and I think this is partially where David's perspective is coming from, and I'll be very blunt about this, um, because it is being manifested uh, in uh, the comments that David and others um, have been making, which is that there is a central belief, and it has always been uh, within the PNC, and again, it's the, the second major uh, political party, which is that there are some people within that political party and again, this is where democracy doesn't have a meaning because I, I, I believe, and I can tell you with good sources of information, that since 1968, the PNC had a rigging machine built in because of the numeric you know, uh, disparity. So that was something that they actually built in, I believe. Uh, and I can say with some confidence, maybe Mr. Hamilton Green was involved in, in that, um, you know, in that committee. Um, but let me just say, the point I'm trying to make is that there are people within the PNC who really believe that because they came here first, because of prior arrival, uh, because of what they have done to transform this landscape in Guyana, that they have that sort of uh, priority built in, that they should be the legitimate governors of Guyana. You see that um, in the speech that Nigel Hughes made um, at the emancipation event where he went off and he basically says, well, we came first and then he stopped. I think he knew where that was going. We've seen that again with the elder, Hamilton Green. Basically, he started off in a sentence by saying, uh, let me tell you who should be on top. We know where he's going because there is a philosophy that's built in. And I can say this with accuracy because we had this debate with people like Ross Michael and so on who touted the same idea that we came first, we suffered more, and the others came after. Therefore, we have the legitimate right to govern. Now, when I say David is not playing with reality, uh, he's talking about the fact, a situation where you have the two dominant group, you know, being uh, in a situation where they're vying for power. But that situation has transformed itself. And by the way, I, I should say that the Indian group has been reduced from a 52% in the 1980s, thanks to the PNC. Right, and they have left Guyana. So we've got two communities right now that are vying for power. But, but what David fails to recognize is that um, we have a situation where there's a lot of transformation taking place in Guyana. Right, you have, um, you know, we're a, 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 we are parties of minorities. Right, those parties can only win, not by the kind of rigging that he's talking about, but but they will they will win by crossover votes, which we have seen in 2020. There have been some studies that have shown that. And of course, you will have other communities that will support, especially the, the PPP, because to his credit, um, Mr. Jack Dave has been campaigning from day one. And, and the PPP, if there's one thing that they, knew, they know how to do well, is to win um, elections. So you have that aspect of things. Yes, it's a, it's a one party majority, but from what I'm seeing- You mean a one seat. I'm sorry, a one seat, thank you. Um, but that one seat may not necessarily be one seat in 2025. You may, you may see from what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing from people is that you have people from, from the PNC uh, who will vote for the PVP. You have the Amarin. And of course, that's a natural thing in politics. You go after the people and you're doing things. Now, that may not make David very happy, but the point is that is happening. Um, and I don't think people may be so fixated in, in, in the politics of the past where we had this competitive nature of, you know, um, of political parties. It still exists. I'm not denying that. But here is the other thing, and I'm going to end here. We are saying, look, we can talk about constitution. Uh, Roy Zell is a very smart fella. Um, he understands the politics, but I think if he puts on the political cap, um, I know he had said to um, Norton, well, you need to be more inclusionary. Uh, and Norton took offense to that when he, he was campaigning um, for party um, chairperson, I believe. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here is that 
it is going to come down to a situation where the party with the more resources, the party with, you know, with, with more command of the media and so on. And I think that is what is scaring the heck out of David because he still believes in the politics of the past. So what I'm suggesting is, um, and I don't think Roy Zill should put all his energy in trying to create a constitution. John Adams says that constitutions are created by people who have, you know, uh, some level of morality and, 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 and goodness in them. But there are people who will have to live by the constitution that they have. Barnum had the best constitution in the world, but look at the nonsense he did, right? Um, my point is this. We should focus, yes, while we're talking about constitutional changes and so on, Let's recognize what Arthur Lewis had said, right? He talked, I'm not going to use the word federalism. I'll talk about devolution of power. That should be something that we have been for, fighting for. And we see that happening over the years because I remember the time when you had to travel to Georgetown to get a passport. You had to travel to, to Georgetown to get an education at the University of Guyana. Those things have changed, right? Uh, I'm saying let's put our effort into devolution, uh, and I know David support this idea, the whole notion, I, I think um, um, Henry Jeffrey support this idea, I see Sherwood um, Lowe support this idea recently, uh, which is that we should have these notions of what are called ethnic impact studies, right? You look at policy and therefore you can evaluate those policy and see if they're discriminatory or if the goals have been met and if the goals are not affecting everyone equitably, then let's sit down and work on that. We can talk about affirmative action, something we have been calling for. Yes, there may be disparity in business, right? Um, as Nigel has said, but I'm also seeing there are disparity in other places. If you want to talk about affirmative action, then you better make sure that there's also affirmative action in the military force and in the disciplinary forces, because that has been an issue for people like um, Ogunseye, right, who talk about the idea that, yeah, you know, that's a force to be reckoned with, and it's about, you know, um, kit and kin. So if you're going to go down that road, let's talk about all of those things and let's focus on that because I believe, David, in 2025, you're going to have a surprise uh, when this election is held. Uh, I'm, I'm so, sure of, I'm very sure of that. That's and I'm going to, I'm going to, you and I agree on that. You and I agree on that. What the surprise is, we so, may disagree. <laughs> right. So, if, 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 if I understand David right, David had two main concerns. One is that there really isn't anything called crossover vote because there isn't much crossover vote. And second point he made is that both major parties are now being minority parties engaged or manipulated the electoral system to become a majority party. So let's hear the view of, of um, Senior Counsel Roysdale Ford, um, how he feels about the preceding comments. Well, well, you know, one of the interesting things about um, Professor and um, Devi Ram, the Devi, what he said, is that whilst their arguments are capable of being accepted, um, I believe that they close their eyes to a number of things. Um, you know, without necessarily defending or coming to the A, which I don't believe that I have to, for a very distinguished and eminent politician like Hamilton Green and what he said, um, we, we have to recognize that the views exposed, expressed by uh, Mr. Green are views that exist in the society. And, and that is a reality and we can't wish them away. And, but, but it is also interesting to note that um, we don't want to accept the historical context in which we live. I, I've read um, numerous books um, which document in the early 19th, uh, the, around 1919 and before, distinguished East Indian Guyanese who required and pleaded with the colonial government to have a, a great number of East Indians come, come to Guyana to reside. And the reason why they did that was not simply one of just having to have, wanting to have uh, more East Indians come here because they felt that in the context of the evolving um, society, in colonial society, that they wanted to have more East Indians come here. And it, so, so we have a history um, of ongoing 
battles, debates, um, coming from different philosophical positions, ultimately seeking to have control, even as a colony, over the resources or the geographic space, which is now what we call Guyana. Um, one of the things that the professor mentioned, and I think we, we have to draw a distinction between devolution of services and devolution of power. And going to a passport in Bartica and picking up one in, in Letem is not devolution of power. That is devolution no, but, but, of no, but, of, but, but so, I support I support the no, devolution of power, right? I was just giving examples of no, some of those things. No, no but, but I agree no, with you on that. I'm not but, but the reason the reason the reason why it is important, the reason why it is important is because we have a current system in which um, even though not fully developed as it can be in the current situation, we see consistently um, the government not permitting the local entities to function. For example, in Georgetown, it, it can't be debated. Georgetown, Linden, New Amsterdam, the restriction of the allocation of resources in relation to the regional bodies and the RDCs, a restriction in terms of the allocation of resources and their control, even the determining of their very budgets. So, so whilst we speak of these things, I want to make a, a point where I draw a distinction between what is the devolution of sources of services as against resources and powers. Now, I, I believe Brother Devi was very strange in, in his understanding of, of what happened at the March 2020 20, 20 elections. It's very interesting that he, he cut out and excluded from his conversation significant portions of what really took place. Um, I'm not again here to speak of or to defend the allegations against Mr. Mingo or not. And even if those allegations are true and it did occur, what GCOM as a body documented as the regulatory and sole constitutional body to be in charge of elections, what it documented, what it found is rigging. And so I'm surprised that we could come in 2024 to articulate a proposition that there's only one guilty party. Is there only one guilty ethnic group that resorted to electoral rigging? Let us look at the spread. And, and, and I, I, I would, you, you, you could see it clearly. This is documented by the Elections Commission. And to date, the Elections Commission has not come out publicly to say that the report that we received, we have rejected it. And going back to the March 2020 elections, they instituted a process of a recount. So what was gathered by way of the observation reports is a record of the elections. What the Elections Commission did at a particular stage is to say that we cannot determine that in terms of its impact on the result of the election. That is what they said. And in so doing, they changed part of the recount order. But these are observation reports that is the, within the body and custody of the Elections Commission. It is a record of the result of the election. It is part of the process. And we cannot deny that this is the only elections in which this has happened. And I can't imagine that as senior people, that we could close our eyes to the fact that in Region 1, 35% of the total votes cast in the region was affected by some form of vote impersonation or, 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 or some sort of anomaly. And that happened consistently throughout the country. It shows that there's a great and serious institutional problem. 75%. Royce, Royce Dale, no, one minute, how, how do you expect people, how are people going to support what you're saying when you have people outside telling people that we have, if we have to rig, we will rig to win? How do you rationalize a statements like that? And, and, and the fact that they have destroyed working with a coalition, they don't have the numbers to win an election. How, how do you get past those things? You, you, you know, the, 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 the problem with what you're saying is that let's go back um, to 2011. There was a minority government where TPP lost control of government in, its, in an absolute sense. In 2015, the PPP lost government. 
So it is not impossible for the PNC um, to win an election with a coalition or probably by itself. Theoretically, it's not. It is not in a distant past. And in the 2025 election that is approaching us, you will have expressed your view, and I certainly understand your view. But I believe that there is a significant and likely chance, despite what you're saying, that will impact on election results, both in terms of its rating, which is not being addressed by the electoralists, none of that has been mentioned by you, right? And the, the misuse that could be, and the abuse that could be put. And, 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 and even when you speak about the government and all that it is doing, you fail to recognize that at the same time, in a purely ethnic sense across this country, across this country, and by pure management, that it is excluding people from society, depriving people from resources, and is reinforcing the very points made that you don't want to accept by, 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 by Dr. Hines. You're reinforcing it. The very governance of the country, by right on the PPP, is reinforcing and giving fuel dissatisfaction in terms of people making a political calculation as to which party they support. So I understand what you're saying. You say that because of the resources and because of what is happening, I and mean, the PPP is going into the communities and they never stop campaigning. You, you, but, but that, to, to some extent, don't reflect the reality of people's circumstances. And, and, and that was what I wanted to add. Let me, I don't want to, I just want to make a quick point. Let me just give you something you can hold on. Yeah, let's hear from Rand. Come back to your point. No, no, let him, let him go ahead. So I respond after. So I could hold on to what he's saying. Well, you know, the question I was asking you is, look, I, I respect what you're saying. And, and obviously, you know, you represent the political party. Um, but I'm, I'm looking at the history of Guyana. I'm looking at what the PNC has done with coalition, right? Twice. Um, I'm looking at the statements. You're not even in, you're not even occupying political office, but we all know Hamilton Green is a very influential person. One of the few remaining, there's Guyana, and there's uh, maybe Nascimento, a handful of people from that era who understands. If you are making those statements, outside, not even in power, that if you have to rig, to, you, you will rig. You're telling people that you're not even elected to office as yet. So how are people, even within your own political party, are going to, to respond to that? And how do you expect them to rationalize that? But, but I, I want to give you something to hold sure. on to. And I, I'm not saying everything is well in the state of Denmark. There are issues. Yes, there are plenty of issues. We are, you know, we were a growing child. We were a growing country. A rigged election uh, does uh, play a role. I, I'm not denying any of that. And I, I'll give you one example, which I wrote about. 1962, um, the, the PPP rigged an election to prevent a guy named Balram Singh Rai from becoming the chairperson of the PPP. Now, the rationale for the PPP for doing that is that they wanted to have a person by the name of Brindley Ben, the father of uh, the current Minister of Home Affairs. Now, I can understand the rationale, right? You're doing this because you want to promote um, the face of a political party that is multi-ethnic. But I'm seeing that they were rigging taking place. It's well documented. It's out there. And Mistress um, Janet Jagan had a, a serious role to play in that. But that is an internal election. The PNC does that also, right? Uh, we've seen that in the past with Norton, you know, saying that the election was rigged and, and then Clarissa Real making the same um, arguments. I'm talking about a national election where the PNC has perfected uh, rigging to such a, a state that you are now saying you're not even in office. If we have to rig, when we, so how are people like yourself, uh, people within your own party are going to trust your party that they are going to represent the interests of all Guyanese? I mean, rigging, well, let me leave it at that. That's just, it doesn't make sense to me let's, looking and listening to what you're saying. But let's ask Mr. Ford, I mean, does the party endorse that view? Well, 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 well that is part of the irony of, of what he's saying. He's transforming the views expressed by Mr. Hamilton Green into the view of a political party. Um, that must be unacceptable. He said it in the presence of a member of GCOM, my friend. 
But, but my brother, does that make it the view of the political party? Does that make it the view of GCOM and by extension the view of the government of Guyana? Because GCOM certainly is a state authority. So we could continue with that illogical line that takes us nowhere. What yourself don't want to accept and you don't want to address this evening is the fact, one, that at a core ethnic issue, the distribution of the resources and the inequitable distribution of resources is fueling a whole heap of problems across the society. You don't want to accept that we now have minority political parties in terms of the geographic, uh, in, in, in terms of these numbers and the impact that could have on the election. And you don't want to accept that after the 2020 elections, GCOM as a body, you could, you could run, you could hide, you could dodge from it. But it is a fact. GCOM as a body documented numerous instances, significant instances of voter manipulation and voter impersonation. So we're talking about going to a next election and you seem rather comfortable, you seem uh, strangely comfortable with an electoral system that is so structured. I wonder whether it was the PNC who had gone into power in 2020 with this electoral record coming out from GCOM, whether you would have been equally comfortable looking at your previous readings and your previous statements, both today and in the past, I could come and hazard a guess that the answer would be no. But somehow you believe by your articulation that you could close your eyes to this. So this becomes nothing worrying because it is a process by which the party that you seem to support is in power and therefore these things don't really matter. But if we want to move to a fair electoral system, we have to address the obvious inefficiencies in the system. And that is, that is my main proposition, which has not been rejected. Brother Devi tried to imagine it away, it never existed. Um, all that happened in 2020 was a man named Ingo reading from a spreadsheet. So there was no recount. And what happened after the recount? So just flip it away. Then this, there was a spreadsheet. Then there was a spreadsheet. This, 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 this has not been rejected by the Elections Commission. And therefore, and therefore, as we move, as we move the debate right. forward, as we remove the debate forward and this discussion forward, I thought that we should try to address um, how do we fix the obvious problems that exist at GCOM and in the electoral system. We, we could talk around it, spin around it, what Hamilton Green says, what he didn't say. That don't change the risks that are inherent and the inefficiencies that, are, that exist in the current electoral system. Uh, let's, hear Ravi, let's hear what Ravi says on, on addressing the issues you raised. Well, I'm going to talk for at least 20 minutes because uh, that's what uh, I think I see David um, looking worried there. Um, the young girls are still the program done. But here, you know, let me. I want to be practical. I returned to this country 32 or 33 years ago. Quit everything in New York, came back here. Never did anything, any work. Immediately work in the sense of a job, you know. Thinking about this thing, looking at this thing, examining it, but from a grassroots level. From a grassroots level, apart from that one foray, into politics. And what was that foray into politics about? It was a practical thing, which is that the PPP we felt was ignoring the ethnic nature of politics in Guyana, that it was still based on race and was going along with an assumption that, uh, you know, that the, P that the WPA had made back in 92, that race had been transcended. It had not, and that's why we entered politics, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in 2001. The point out of that and of our learning by being involved was this, that no society is static, as David um, is, is, is taking as a premise, that somehow these societies will not change. People will not move across. Sir Arthur Lewis talked about West African societies. And they implemented some of his measures, federalism, deep devolution of power and all that. And yes, uh, you, you need the whole uh, no, uh, notion of having different competencies 
really sent the cat into fear, which doesn't exist here. And that's why you can't run away. And that was our position that, uh, for example, when Nigel used my friend had uh, in charge of the PNC's or APNU's Constitutional Reform Committee, I made a presentation there and I brought up the whole notion of uh, federalism once again. And, you know, we were told, let's talk about deep devolution. But until you have it up there, where the people at the center are denied constitutionally, where the court can then tell them you can't touch it, they will interfere. They will. That's how uh, power uh, works and then the nature of it, the exercise in power. Those competencies will have to define. So whether we call it federalism or not, until the devolution of power, that's what I am. I agree with that. You need devolution of power, but until it is made that the center cannot constitutionally interfere with the competencies of the nature, you'll have this interference. That's one thing I want to talk about. Coming back to the, the, the nature of societies not being static. And I come back to my own experience having departed from, 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 uh, from politics and passed on. Roar went into coalition with GAP. And when we won one seat, I accepted that Franklin, uh, Everett Franklin would represent us as GAP Roar. And I was very comfortable uh, with that. So it was the point is that it was a position. And what was that position? That we need a wider representation of interest when policies are being made. But what but by then also we recognized after the 2006 elections, when I went around with Gap because I campaigned with them, the Indian population had dropped uh, dramatically. So I didn't need the 2012 census to know that the, that, that the Indians were gone. There were so many houses boarded up in Indian villages. So from 2009 and 10, I waged a war almost single handedly in the press that the PNC should moderate its image, that the PNC should even change its name because of that historical baggage. I was a opposed by people like Freddie Kisun. I was opposed by Lincoln Lewis. I was opposed by Eric Phillips. I don't remember David uh, coming after me. But the point is they were saying by saying that um, the PNC should not come out in the streets and take on the PPP frontally, that I was asking for Africans to be paralyzed forever. But I knew the numbers were not there to put the PPP back in office automatically. And it was us, we in the roar, myself and Beto Ram and others, who defined the ethnic security dilemma of African Guyanese. That if Indians had a built-in majority, then it encouraged them not to, go, to use only parliamentary methods. Extra parliamentary uh, methods was almost a rational choice. We are the ones who define that. But by 2008, we, we knew and we conducted surveys, the, the, the results was there. And lo and behold, as those of a biblical incl uh, inclination would say, 2011, the PPP was stymied. They were checkmated. They couldn't get a majority in parliament. And by that peculiarity of our constitution that Mr. Burnham introduced for reasons that I, I think I know, but I'll, I'll, I'll go, won't go there at this point. We had a minority executive and uh, an opposition in parliament. And the writing was on the wall. Moderate your, your, your politics and you will get into power. Reach across the divide. Because unlike what David thinks, both communities, while in the main, they may cleave as Marcus Garvey said, in the case of Africans to the black or Indians, Indians claim to, the, to, that, to their side, there will always be a substantial number who are thinking and who are affected. And we saw that in 2011, so the PPP uh, was rigging and I believe they tried to think too, they're not angels, they play hardball politics, but they lost in 2015. And there's that thing that Arthur Lewis proposed, 
coalition. You get me? The Hutus will not necessarily vote with the Tutsi, Tutsis. Arthur Lewis knew that, but if you can form a coalition, that things might work. And in Ghana, we saw that. In Kenya, we saw that. Why can't we do it here? But in both times that the PNC tried it, they shot themselves in the foot. They shot, and that has been my concern because the, 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 the low hanging fruit was there. You took it, you had it in your grasp. Now you let, let's take about sugar. Let's talk about policies, shooting yourself in the foot. You had a commission of inquiry into sugar that said, give us three years. Let us stabilize sugar. The, the CCY Thomas was there. Uh, in that in that, in that committee, uh, I think Parvatan was the head of the of, of that committee. Give us free stabilized sugar and let's sell the goddamn thing. Let's privatize it, right? Mr. Granger, I don't know the in, internal intricacies, went against all of that and unilaterally shuttered f um, four plantations. What do you think going to happen to the? You effectively made the AFC the dead meat that they had feared, and it's going to take a lot to bring that back. So it comes back to the present PPP strategy, right? It just doesn't take a genius. As we have said, if you're a minority, you can choose to say, I'll use violence, which Mr. Green uh, proposed uh, uh, can be used. You can use rigging, and that's, way, that's the, the easy, the quick way then, if you have the resources, if you have people who can back you in the army and the forces that should prevent those things. You, they, and then you can make those kinds of uh, statements. And that now creates a fear in, in the other side. So those people who may have thought that the PPP is riding roughshod over them as they had done by 2011 and 2015, they would then you are now driving them. And right now, the rhetoric of the PNC, and I'm surprised at what Roysdale Ford is saying on this forum here. By this sort of rhetoric, you are merely intensifying the fears in the communities that may want to vote for you or at least stay at home and not come out and vote. The, the Indians are not all going to uh, say that we're going to just close our eyes and vote PPP. Who Many people didn't think that the teacher strike would run this long and you would have that amount of Indian teachers participating. It depends on the issues. But if in the midst of that strike, the kind of rhetoric will be spewed, let us resort to violence again, let us uh, you know, resort to things, let us defend election rigging by this fine uh, you know, parsing of what constitutes rigging and whether the, the list is all of that. This rigging was so blatant, man, the inter international uh, commi committees that were here denounced it. I don't think that... Um, uh, our, 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 our ex-Jamaican president uh, had any skin in the game. I don't think Mr. Rowley had any skin in the game. I don't think Mia Martin had any skin in the game. And I, I would like uh, Mr. Ford at some point to tell me what did the, the, those individuals who came to do the recount uh, from on behalf of CARICOM for that recount, um, what did they say? What did they say? How did they judge some of the claims made by the PNC? Some of the objections that are made by the PNC? Most of them were discarded, you know. So if you're going to go down that route and try to defend things and pass it that finally, the voters out there ain't going to be listening to, uh, to you. You've lost them already. Lastly, I want to say this. More than anyone, I have attempted to work with, I was an opposition member of parliament. I spent countless hours with Mr. Hoyt. Not only did we suggest that, that, that this uh, reaching across the divide, but we talked about if you're going to bring in other people from within, outside of your group, into your party, you must have what we call ethnic caucuses, taking from the, an American experience, that have within the PNC an ethnic caucus those Indians that are in the party, right, who uh, you want them to be showing the Indian people that we really represent you. And when they speak up, unlike what David did to call them slave catchers, right, 
that doesn't do any good. If that is the honest opinion of those Indians as to what occurred and they spoke out on how they saw things from their lived experience as people of Indian origin, then let it be. That is what they call saying. Listen to them uh, at all that. The same message we have given to the PPP, but uh, that, of course, I don't think is ever going to be there also. Both these parties want to have their cake and eat it too. You want to attract uh, outside votes, but you don't want the, 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 the people of that ethnic group that is outside you to speak on their own. There is that fear. They may say what you don't want. So the mouth then becomes muzzled or is seen to be muzzled. And that is the dilemma. The PPP, however, and we can see this, is in office just as the PNC was, and they had oil monies coming in. The PNC had all, they knew oil money was going to come in and yet shot themselves in the foot. Well, the PPP have oil money coming in. They have oil money coming in. And they are using it to woo votes. We can call them slave catchers. We can call them what you want. But they are individuals who will cross over. I live on West Coast and I always speak about my experience. The PPP group in Denamstel is a very substantial one now. A lot of young people are there. I live in Eiffel my whole life. I live on the ground in Eiffel, the section of Eiffel called Eiffel Kashba. I would like Royzel to tell me which PNC big one has come in to Eiffel Kashba recently to talk to those people, uh, though those are people, especially young blacks in, in, in Eiffel. Tandai McAllister, niece of my friend James, right, has left the party, has quit the party in disgust and is now saying she is supporting uh, Irfan Ali. He's making a fine distinction there. That is not a, a singular event. Trust me, I'm in Eiffel. I am speaking from Eiffel right across Kashmir is behind me there. I go to Dikendran, where Mr. Bonham put up that scheme at, at the predominantly African uh, origin in Dikendran. You go there. You go to uh, Vorganujan, which we call Vege. If you come this side of town, you talk about you going to Vege. See the PPP group and what the PPP is going doing there. So they are doing what all political parties do. Use the resources that they have at their command to woo these voters. And it is my feeling, of course, that there will be a substantial number. Now, the point is in Guyana, you don't need a substantial number. You don't need a substantial number of people. We are only divided by one seat or two uh, there. So you don't need that. So they are comfortable. They know they're going to go to the full court press and they're going to come out uh, with, 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 with enough from there without rigging because I am uh, will demand, people like me will demand that there will be observers, that the list be, be checked, all of those things. We can, we'll talk about it. But I'm saying based on their policy, of not alienating through their language, their rhetoric, and their um, policies, not alienating blacks. The only thing I'm fine, I think my, my comment to them is that if they were to allow ethnic caucuses, and I spoke to several African members, prominent ones, and they say that there's no sign of that occurring, but that's the old PPP way of, you know, this democratic centralism is called to make the decisions top down. I'd like to just point out one, um, how to put it, lack of sensitivity to concern for Mr. Royzel Ford, who is a young upcoming politician, to be addressing me as Devi. Devi is the feminine form of Dave. You will, there is no individual in this 1.4 billion Indians where a male would be named Devi and Roysdale not being sensitive to the nuances at that level of the Indian community has done a disservice in, in, in trying to attract those votes if he can't even get a name of an individual who's been involved with the PNC for over 32 years. Okay, so, so, so gentlemen, we got four minutes left. Um, David, Summarize, please, and then, please let David talk. 
I just want to start by responding to this notion that I am anti-change. I don't believe the society is dynamic. I, I, I agree there is change. There's change to the worse when it comes to race relations. My friends are saying there's change to the better. I am saying there's change to the worse. So please don't insult me by saying that I don't believe that the society has changed. I think our race relations today are worse than they were 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And I am saying, please do not tell me that the solution to the problem is for the PNC to go and get 5% Indian votes or the PPP to go and get 5% black vote and everything will be all right. What am to the 95%? And it is the 95% is what happens to the group. Will the PPP get 5% crossover votes? And will that transform the PPP into giving the teachers a living wage? Will that transform the PPP into dividing the corn equally? Will that make the PPP agree to a new voters list? Will that make the PPP agree to a democratic GCOM. If it will, I will go tomorrow and encourage 10% of Africans to go and join the PPP. If it will make the PPP behave democratically. And if it will make the PNC behave democratically, I will encourage you all to go and find Indians and tell them, go vote for the PNC. I'm saying that even if you get 5% crossover vote, it will not change the dynamics of race and racial discrimination in Guyana. The solution to a problem is not a, 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 an electoral solution. Elections come and elections go. They've come and they've gone. And our problems remain the same in terms of ethnic groups. Our ethnic groups, by and large, are suspicious of the leadership of the other group. That has not changed, even as our society is it itself has undergone change. Thanks, yes. thanks for those points. We have a limitation right. of time. Let's uh, Dr. Ramara, 30 seconds, please. Um, well, very quickly, um, you know, this is, I think David could take the licking from us uh, because I think he's accustomed to that. But No, but, and I can keep back <laughs> I can okay, give well, we'll, All right, and that's right. So we'll continue with that discussion. But let me just say, and I hope I don't sound patronizing um, to Roy's deal. Um, he's a smart guy. Um, I, I listened to him when he made the argument, which was something revealing to me, which is that we don't have uh, the kind of, um, you know, labor laws and so on because the political parties came out of that movement. And that's something uh, I'm sure he'll play a major role in helping to develop. Um, so, so, so I think, he, you know, um, there's some important things that he said, which, which was very helpful for us. In terms you mean of he said on Politics 101? Yes, exactly. And I, I do watch your show carefully so I can uh, get some points uh, from what you're saying. Uh, but Roysdale, sometime, you know, what I would say is you have to kind of put on the, the political hat sometimes. I know you're a lawyer. Um, and I think rhetoric, as, as Ravi had said, is, is important. Um, you know, a lot of the things I think you said today were more of a, a sort of a, you know, from a legal um, sense. But and I'll give you an example. Um, you know, when you make comments to like things like, and I think somebody had picked you up on this. You know, saying that uh, President Ali is no different from, you know, uh, the slave masters and so on. I, I think the rhetoric is important, and I, and I do see you as playing a very functional, uh, a very important role uh, within uh, the PNC. And, uh, and so I, I wanted to end uh, with that. And, and I was impressed with the fact that you did say that the, the PNC need to be more inclusionary. Uh, and, and I think Norton had responded to that a couple of years back. Um, and so let, let me leave it at that. Um, and I also want to end by saying I have been a teacher in the classroom for about 34 years. Um, and I think teachers, you know, you're not just a teacher when you step into that classroom and you go on, the, on that stage. You're, you're a teacher, you're a psychologist, you know, you're a nurse because kids come in when they're sick, you know, uh, uh, you're, you're all kinds of things, all kinds of issues there that you're dealing with as a teacher. So a teacher plays many, many different roles. 
Uh, and I do believe that collective bargaining, that's my sympathy, that's where it lies. And, and hopefully, um, you know, this thing can be resolved um, in the interest of the teachers, because to me, that's crucial. And that's because I've spent so many years as a teacher myself. Um, so, but again, it doesn't help when uh, Ms. McDonald says uh, this is an, you know, uh, installed regime. So the rhetoric has to be torn down and hopefully there'll be collective negotiation and and the teachers can get what they want. I'll end with that. Sorry, Dr. Bissar. Sorry, one second, Dr. Bissar. Sorry, sorry, Dr. Bissar. One second. Uh, we, Globesign would like to just uh, extend the program a few minutes and let Dr. Hines finish the point that he was making in order um, as everyone else was able to. So uh, Dr. Hines, you could go ahead. Um, Hello. But yeah. let's, let's hear why. Well, there's time at the end. If there's time at the end, because I think I lost my train of thought. Um, okay. But, you know, I'll try to regain it. But so the others can go on. And if there's time at the end, I'll. Right, still go ahead, please. Oh, um, I, I believe that at the end of the conversation uh, this evening, we have not, um, in my opinion, yet addressed um, significant issues of national concern. Um, we cannot deny at this stage that um, the electoral system in Guyana is not up to mark. Um, I believe that we, as approach the next election, we need to put in place the necessary arrangements to ensure that we could have a credible election um, so that if there is a recount, we could see those sort of figures um, considerably reduced or non-existent. Um, I believe at the end of the day, we have had um, a conversation coming from different perspectives. It's good to have them, but I believe that ultimately we have not um, focused on the ethnic issues in terms of the allocation of resources, the impact that that is having on different communities, particularly the African Guyanese community, and how that will relate to their calculus and the process of choosing a government. Um, there will always be um, instances where um, people will move and transition back and forth. I believe um, Dr. Hines and myself, um, we're not saying that in, by any extent the situation is static, but I believe that once we want to speak about um, elections, we got to speak about bringing in Guyana, and we have to take a, a step back we move from the historical link that we have heard so much tonight and address it in a contemporary context, which is what I believe Dr. Hines um, so carefully articulated. And from the other side, what I believe is another side, have regard to the views, they have not come to address and deal with that issue in the current situation. Um, they want to wish it away, especially as Mr. Dev would have indicated. I can't recall um, calling Mr. Dev Devi, but certainly, um, if I did that, that must have been a slip of the tongue, and it was by no means any attempt to um, embarrass or insult Mr. Dev. But coming back to where we are, I believe that we certainly have to address um, electoral rigging. Um, I believe that the conversation this evening has not gotten to the point of actually recognizing that it is something that currently exists. It, it seems to be a boogeyman or just simply a historical uh, record. But somehow I learned from um, Mr. Dev this evening that he's recognizing that neither, in, either party would engage in such activities. But I was hoping to have from him, to have elicited from him a more engaging conversation as to how it could be addressed and how it could be resolved. Uh, Professor Dev? Well, I want to conclude by saying that uh, right after the elections, there was um, an election um, reform um, committee, wasn't there? And it took submissions and all of that. I'm not so sure where that stands right now, but I would like to feel that the PNC participated in that, and made their recommendation, and we have to all ensure that uh, the parts of the electoral law that needs to be tightened and corrected um, should be there. So, for example, I was one of those back in the turn of the, the century that stood with the PNC to talk about the clean voters list. And I took a lot of flack for that. David will uh, hopefully remember uh, when I stood with, with all of us at the 
town hall and stood for that. It is, we, we, we cannot, I, I will close with this thought, that if we are to go forward as a viable society, we have to have some acceptance of truth. Vincent Alexander, Vincent and myself had a little discussion in the press on this. And not truth in any capitals, but truth on these basic narratives that we purvey. Because that is how we act, and that is what actuates us, these narratives. And what I am hearing tonight is that the truth of David and Roysdale is different from the truth of Beturam and myself. And we are all individuals who have spent a lot of time, in my case, like I said, uh, 30 odd years doing nothing else. And even before that in New York, doing a hell of a lot, uh, thinking about these things. So what I would like to say is that we need to have these discourses. And myself and Nigel Hughes have been talking about this for years, that we should go on a common platform and talk rather frankly to show that the discussion can be civil for one. Two, that yes, we have different truths. I, again, well, we, I don't know, we can't go on all night, but I just want to say that uh, this whole notion of economic development, which is critical, which is critical, I have pointed out and I've de enumerated it, that Mr. Burnham in his 28 years at the helm did an awful lot to change that situation, whether in Rice, as he did in his first term, 64, 68, whether later in Sugar, by taking the Sugar Levy to develop Guyana, whether later in housing, when he had to feed housing close the nation, whether through the co-op movement, where he gave uh, um, Africans at the grassroots, uh, you know, a basic uh, amount, whether through the co-op bank, where they could get loans from. And yet by 1992, the Indians had, when we did a household income and expenditure survey, the two groups were about the same. How did that happen? They didn't get the PPP to help them do anything. You get me? And we have to talk a bit frankly about this. You know how Robert and myself, Robert Corbin and myself, we used to talk a lot about this. You don't understand? How does it so? Beturam once talked about his father's approach towards it, and David, uh, you know, uh, how do I put it, um, scoffed at it. That's an individual expression. But it's that individual expression multiplied a hundred thousand times that creates that wealth. Is 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 what you do with. So I don't want to go off on a tangent, but I think we, this discussion needs to continue. We have to be frank with each other on where we differ, uh, but but we must have a commitment to some kind of truth. We must arrive at some kind of truth where we agree. So, for example, on the rigging situation, as I said, I have always said this. You know, it's in writing. It's there in publication. The PPP doesn't play softball politics. You understand? We know they will uh, try a thing, as we say. So therefore, the, 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 the scrutinization of the process must be so tight and we, can input, we must put systems into place. I agree with that, but I would like to they differ from Roysdale's conclusion that from all I read coming out of the 2020 elections, they uh, substantiated what um, Claudia Singh has said as a, as a, as a jurist back in 19, uh, 2001, I think she made a ruling that the discrepancies or the meddling was not sufficient to make any change in uh, the, the results. And Justice Cross also said the same thing after the 1997 elections. And I think that's where we stand. So if we can't go on talking about an illegal install regime and all that, you know, we're just spinning too many wheels without getting any traction. Thank you, gentlemen. But the, uh, um, I'm ready running. Give me back my couple of minutes that you. Yes, I, yes. yeah, I am. Okay, the final. You're yeah, the final. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I, just, I just want to. David. Yes? 
I just want to echo Royce Denford's view, you know. Um, for us to talk about redirections, we have to agree on some minimum, some something minimum. I think Ravi, Ravi is touching on the surface. He's a he's a he's a diplomat and so on. No, no, he no, no. Want, He doesn't Claudette want to say that the PPP is too. As a lawyer, you know? no. Claudette, <laughs> as a ruling. Yeah, but, 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 but yeah, yeah, no, but, but Ravi, 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 I, I am not. The yeah, but I'm not here to talk about the technicalities of what Claudette said and what this jury said. I'm here to deal with the sociology of rigging and the politics of rigging, and that it is there in our society embedded, and the very nature and the very recent development of our society in moving to a petrol state opens up the possibility of more rigging rather than less rigging. And I think that is what I am trying to put out here tonight. That, and, and I think 2025 is going to be a hell of an election because the question of rigging is going to be front and center. And I think if we wish it away here with technicalities, yes, the elections of 2020 were certified. They were certified. And so nobody can argue against that. There is a certified government. But if people want to feel the government is installed, um, that, that's, that's, that, that's their business and that they should be allowed to express themselves. I want to say here, I do not believe that Indian people are responsible for the condition of African people, economically, politically, and culturally. And I do not believe that African people are responsible for the condition of Indian people. I want to make that very, 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 very clear here tonight. My defense of African people's pride, their dignity, and the right to exist as equal citizens is born out of a universal view that all of us have an equal and equitable right. In my previous earlier incarnation, when Indian people under the PPP regime said they were discriminated against, I didn't ask how. I didn't ask how many votes. I felt it was my right as a human rights advocate to stand with Indian people. And if under the PPP government, African people are charging the same thing, I have a moral right to stand with them. And if one points to a coalition government violating Indian people's rights by knocking off 7,000 sugar workers, are with you there. But you must turn your mouth the next side and say there is an Indian PPP government that is violating the rights of 13,000 teachers by refusing to give them a living wage. That's what I want to hear. I have written Don't that. Oh, I have, I have written that. Ravi, give, me, Ravi, give me my time. But I write about you can't say I did that, but oh, I did. Don't, don't talk about the failure of the coalition government in that regard. And don't talk about failure of the PPP government. But I have. Both, both governments. I have. Both, both governments, the PPP government and the coalition government. They are taking advantage of the Guyanese people, and we have to put mechanisms in place to stop that advantage. Not by telling the PPP, use the oil money and go and get some black votes to get a majority. Or tell, tell PPP, PNC, don't talk about your supporters suffering, tone it down, tone it down so you can get some Indians. That may have its place, but for me, that is not the solution to Guyana's problem. The solution to Guyana's problem for me is when Indians and Africans and Amerindians and all the other ethnic groups can feel they have an equal and equitable place, place in this society. And that is the big struggle as we move into becoming a, a, a well-oiled petrol state. All right, let's make that the final word, David. Thank you very much, gentlemen, again. And hopefully we'll continue this conversation. In fact, it needs to be continued. Thank you again.
Good night, all. Good night, guys. I got to run. Thank you.